All right, we'll go ahead and get started. So today we're going to be having our webinar on configuring and using surveys. It's a module that we've covered before, but it's been quite a while since we've had a webinar covering surveys. We're going to be going over basic configuration, and then we'll talk about some of the updates that have been made. There's been a few kind of mostly cosmetic changes to the way surveys work. Um, we'll also be going over uh, how to configure a survey as a poll or use it as an election. Uh, but before we get too deep into our content, let's go over our housekeeping. So all of your microphones are going to be muted. If you have questions, please throw those into the chat. We have Samantha from our team there. She'll be happy to answer questions throughout. And then any questions that seem um, that may be something I haven't covered, we'll go over during the Q&A at the end. So go ahead and feel free to put those questions in the chat at any time, and then we'll go back to the, uh, to the ones that haven't been fully answered in the chat towards the end. Um, Lastly, there will be a recording of this webinar on our YouTube channel, um, so keep an eye out for that. If you have to leave early or you're joining late, um, you can always go and watch the recordings of all of our webinars and all of our training videos, um, as well as all of our release announcements over on our YouTube channel. For a calendar of all of our upcoming webinars, you can go to clubexpress.com and you'll see the calendar button in the upper right hand corner. Uh, when you click on calendar, you'll see all of our scheduled meetings that are that are coming up and you can join those. If you register for a webinar ahead of time, there's actually a section in the webinar where you can enter questions ahead of time. So if there's something pertaining to our topic that you want to see done specifically, you can put it in there and we can add that into our uh, webinar presentation. For our recordings, if you go to YouTube, you will find uh, clubexpress.com when you look for when we look for our channel. That is dot with the dot spelled out. So that's clubexpress dot com. And while you're there, you can go ahead and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Uh, if you subscribe, then anytime we put up recordings of our webinars or if we put up recordings of our training videos or uh, version announcements, you'll be able to see when those happen. You'll get little notifications when you're looking at YouTube. And the last thing before we get started on the actual content for our webinar is reviews. We love to hear from our customers. We love to hear how they are feeling about the products, what ideas they have for improving our product, or just what has worked well for them. So if you go to clubexpress.com forward slash reviews, there will be a few links for you to submit reviews for Club Express. And we just, we really love to hear uh, from our clients. And that'll help other people who are considering Club Express decide if it's the right product for them. All right, so today we're going to be primarily talking about surveys. We're going to talk about um, how to kind of do the basic configuration and setup. There's not a whole lot to getting started. Um, really, we're just going to start on how to cover our categories. Once we've categorized our surveys, we'll talk about how to configure them. And one of the main configurations when you're starting a survey is what kind of survey you're creating. And there's three kind of main types of surveys. There's elections, which have their own pre-built kind of um, settings. There's our standard surveys, which are just um, have a lot more configuration options to them. But when you create a standard survey, it is not locked into the predefined setup of an election. And then there's polls, which are surveys that are one question surveys that are put on the custom page or home pages. So you can put a poll on a page. It's not something that you necessarily email out or put on your surveys page. It's just a poll that shows up on a page and when a member clicks on it, they'll see the results. And we'll go through that process in just a few minutes. We'll also talk about the actual configuration of a survey. So things like availability and close method, um, whether or not you allow anonymous responses or contacts, those types of things are all built into that initial um, configuration when you're creating a survey. Uh, and when we go through those, we'll step through what each of those things mean. We're also going to take a look at the pre and post amble. Um, so a lot of you have probably heard the term preamble before. That is just something that you'll present before people take a survey. Uh, we also have a post amble, which means it's a little screen or a little bit of dialogue or some images that you display uh, once someone has put in their answers. And we'll talk about the different configurations. There's actually two different ways to present your post amble. We'll spend a good majority of our time talking about the different question types. So when you're creating a survey, obviously we're wanting to collect answers to questions that we have. And Club Express has a large amount of different types of questions that you can ask. The nice thing about the way questions work in Club Express is that once you learn to do questions for surveys, those same question principles apply to things like event questions or additional member data questions or even ad hoc form questions. So um, those are going to be 
reusable. The skills that you learn here for question types in a survey are reusable in other modules within Club Express. So that's a part to definitely pay attention to. Once we're done with that, we'll go into what to do after you've created a survey. So things like once you've collected that information on the survey, how do you get reports to show what people's responses were? We'll also go over what the confirmation email. So when someone submits a survey, they'll get a little confirmation email saying, hey, thanks for submitting your survey. Um, and we, we will go over how to customize that. And then we'll also go over the uh, aesthetic options for surveys. So like I said, there's been a few small adjustments to the way uh, the surveys are aesthetically displayed. So we'll go over how to control that and what changes have been made. So the first thing we're gonna start with is the basic configuration and then how to begin creating a new survey. Um, so now I'm going to go ahead and just kind of quickly preview this page. We're going to be looking at for our first section, just categorization, which is probably the, you know, those of you who've been with Club, Club Express for any amount of time are familiar with how much we love to categorize things. And surveys is no different. It's a pretty simple, just give it a category name. We'll also go over the specifics for elections. So when you choose to make an election as a survey, um, that is intended for choosing new board members or choosing new organization, you know, executives, whatever you need to elect for, um, you can set up an election and that does a few things to your survey. Um, it will force anonymous responses. So that's anonymous even for Club Express admins, for your admins. You know, no one will be able to see who voted for who when you configure that as an election. It also becomes immediately members only, meaning non members are unable to answer an election question. Um, it will kind of tie a member ID to an answer. So each member will only be able to vote once, and there is no way to um, allow someone to put in two votes. Um, and then the last thing is once you do configure an election, it can't be deselected. So once you create an election and save it from that point on, it cannot be made not an election because if we allowed that, then obviously you would be able to turn off the election function and then go in and access things like people's answers and stuff like that. So once it's configured as an election, it is hard coded and cannot be undone. You'd have to start a new survey if you wanted to change or modify that, that survey to be not an election, you'd have to start a new one. We're also going to take a look at availability. That one's a pretty simple configuration option that is mainly basically just mainly just focused on whether you're looking for survey responses from members or survey responses from members and non-members. Um, we'll also take a look at the close method. So when we say close method, that just means how do we stop accepting answers from uh, this survey? So you know. Couple popular options are things like number of responses, meaning you know we're looking for a hundred responses to this survey, and once we hit that cap, the survey will then turn off and no one will be able to take it anymore. Um, the manual close option just means this survey will be open forever, and as many people can answer it as want as we want, but eventually we will go in and turn it off. And then the last close method is close date, meaning we set a date and the morning of, so when, you know, when, when the clock ticks over to that date, you will no longer be able to take that survey. Um, for close date, to be specific, that does mean once that date ticks over. So if we want to close it, say, you know, Friday, you know, if we want to say the last day you can submit a survey is Friday, you would want to set the close date for Saturday. Because um, that way, once the clock ticks over to Saturday, then that the survey will close. And then the last thing for anonymous responses when we're creating a survey, when you are creating a survey, there is an option to allow non-members to take it. So we, I mentioned that briefly for availability. If you are going to allow people who are not members to take your survey, you do have to allow, um, a, a, at least allow, maybe not require, but we'll go over that availability option. But uh, you have to allow anonymous responses for non-members. The reason for that is to the way our website sees the public, non-members are anonymous. We don't store their information the same way we store members. So when a non-member visits the website and clicks on a survey, our website doesn't actually know who they are because they're not logged in because they are not members. So if you're allowing non-members to take the survey, we have to view them as anonymous. That's just how our website interacts with kind of the general public. So let me go ahead and switch over to our demonstration and I'm going to uh, change my screen really quick. Give me just a second. All right, I am on the Chicago Association of Financial Planners. This is one of our demo websites. Um, and I'm going to go take a look at the kind of walkthrough process of creating a survey. 
When I go into the control panel, we're going to find the surveys module underneath the communications tab. And in communications, it's one of our website modules. And there we will find surveys. When we click on surveys, we're going to land on the survey manager page. On this page, we get presented with a pretty simple screen. A lot of you are probably used to the search box. This is our probably simplest search box you'll see in most of our modules, which is just going to ask for a category and whether or not we want to search for active only. You don't have to fill in anything on this page. You can just hit search and it will show you all of our surveys. And because this is one of our demo websites, we have a ton of surveys here. If we want to narrow this down, we could pick just one category or we could just check the box that says active only. And if I check that box and hit search again, now it's only showing me the surveys that are currently active. And I've gone ahead and set up just one survey, which is one we'll walk through in a little bit. But for now, let's talk about if we wanted to create a new survey. So this is our search tool. Before we start on a survey, we have to define our categories. Now I'm on a demo site with categories set up, but if we click on survey categories here, we can go here. Uh, the first time we use our survey module, we need to create some categories. So if we didn't have any categories configured yet, we would have to go in and hit add survey category. And this would be our first category. And all it's gonna ask for is a name. So this is mainly for behind the scenes categorization. The survey categories will not really apply to the people actually taking the surveys. This is primarily just for your purposes to organize your data. If you're um, only doing you know, one or two surveys a month, you may need only one survey category and you can just name it default or surveys. You just need to have at least one. If you're the type of organization and you're having, you know, dozens of surveys every month and you're going to build up, you know, one or 200 surveys a year, it might be more important for you to subcategorize your surveys and have, you know, a good, you know, 10 or 12 survey categories. That way it's easier for you to find uh, what you need. Once you create that survey category, it's going to show up on this page. Um, you can go in and you can always change the name of any of these categories just by clicking on the pencil to get this screen again. And once you've created a survey category, you'll notice some of the survey categories here will have the trash can icon to delete and some will not. Whenever you see the category options where some categories have a trash can and some categories don't, that means those categories are being used. As long as there is content, as long as there is member information, so people have filled out surveys under that category, you can't delete the whole category because every survey must belong to a category. So those surveys that are in that category are uh, will need to be changed. Now it is possible after the fact to go into a survey's configuration and change it off of that. So if we really were dedicated to getting rid of a particular category, we could say we can go into our elections category and go search for all of our elections. And we could search for all of them, not just active only. And we could go in and change all of these off of the elections category. And that would allow us to delete the elections category once there are no longer any surveys existing on that category. Now, that's not really a problem. There's no storage limitations for the number of categories you have. So if you have a category that's no longer available or you're not going to use it anymore, you could just change the name and add parentheses and say, you know, old or deprecated or whatever nomenclature you want to use to denote that you're not using that category anymore. More, and we're not going to, you know, care that you have, you know, 20 or 30 different survey categories. All right. So once you have your categories created, the next step is actually to start making a, a survey. So on the surveys manager page, we're going to see three buttons. We have our survey categories. We've already talked about that. We have our ad survey and we have our ad poll. If we are making a standard survey or an election, we are going to use the survey option to create those. The other option would be to add a poll, and we will be talking about that towards the tail end of this, because um, a lot of the tools for making a poll are going to be the same for making a standard survey. So all of those kind of, uh, that tool belt will still apply. When we go and hit add survey, we're going to get this pop-up add survey screen. It's going to ask for a few things. The first is going to be a title. And this is just the name of the survey that you're requesting information for. Um, you can say, you know, 2023 board election. You can say, you know, are you satisfied with, you know, our organization? You can, whatever the name for your survey you want to enter. 
The next thing is a description, and this is just a small description for your survey. Um, oftentimes I see that people don't fill this out and that's totally fine. Um, you'll notice the little red dot icon that denotes a required field is not over here to the right of description. You're totally welcome to leave this blank. This will just display a small description when members go to look at and take the survey. It will give them a little preview of what survey they're taking. The next configure op configuration option we're going to see is this configure as election button. This is the button we're going to hit where we're going to kind of take a hard left or right turn from is this a normal survey or is this an election? When I check this election box, it's going to say it's going to say caution when you configure the survey as an election, this setting cannot be reversed. If I say OK at this point. It's going to check this uh, election box. And from this point on, I'm creating an election and I can't roll these choices back. So once I configure an election, it has to stay that way. The next thing we're gonna choose is a category. And these are all of those categories that we just signed up for. Again, these don't really matter to the members. This is just for uh, the organization. This is just for organization purposes. So for now, I'm just gonna say, this is a webinar example survey. You'll notice this is one of my first places where my election choice is going to matter. Availability, I cannot change this. When I configure it as an election, availability is stuck as members only because elections only apply to members. The next checkbox, checkbox we're going to get is going to be this primary and solo members only option. So some of your organizations are not going to have secondary members or tertiary members, so this may not apply. But for those of your organizations where you have maybe a business organization where you have someone running an, uh, their membership for sub members like secondaries, or you have household memberships where you might have someone who has a partner and their partner is marked as a secondary member, this option will matter. If you are doing some sort of vote or survey where only each household or each business gets a vote, checking this will mean that only the primary members are able to take the survey. That would uh, not allow secondary members to be, partake in this election or survey. You can also control the survey button text. This is just going to be what displays, those of you who have been on our events surveys before, this is like say changing the text for that register button. We can say take survey or we can say vote if it's an election and say vote here, whatever you want the button to begin the survey to say, that's what you can choose to uh, create that. And then with elections, another one of our hard coded options is going to be close method end date. Elections are always done in a time frame. So for an election, we can say we're turning off our elections on Friday. And so we can let our members know, you know, for the week of, you know, from the 9th through the 12th, this survey is going to be available. And then actually, if we're if it's available on the 12th, we'll want to set it to the 13th. So then that means it will be available on the 12th. But as of the 13th, this survey will be closed. One more election hard coded option is this allow anonymous responses for an election. Anonymous responses are always required, meaning we are not going to record who voted for who, who recorded what answer. The only bit of information we will tie to a member profile is whether or not they have uh, recorded a response. And even that is invisible to admins. So if a member votes, the only way anyone would be able to tell if that member has voted or not is if that member logs in and tries to go to that uh, option to vote again, it would tell them you have already filled out the survey. But even administrators would not be able to go and say, you know, hey, did this person vote yet or not? Because that would still give them, you know, an idea of who voted for who. So that information is also kept private. There is an option to allow members to take a survey multiple times for an election. Obviously, this is also set to no. This is not a, a possibility. We do have the option to set a contact person. So when we set a contact person, this is going to be the person that is listed as this survey's you know, primary. If you have someone in charge of your elections, someone in charge of collecting survey responses, you can choose this select option here and you'll see a familiar select member pop up. And this is going to be the same select member pop up that you'll see all over Club Express. And you can use this option to search by last name. And so we can go in here and grab George Abba here. And this will mark this uh, 
this person as the survey contact. You do have an option to notify them when a survey response is completed. Again, if it's an anonymous response, George would get a notification that a uh, that a vote has been submitted, but no personal information would be tied to that vote. The last option we get on this configuration page for an election would be the show post amble last. We'll talk about the pre and post amble shortly, but really what a post amble is, is just a little bit of text or a little bit of a display box that you'll want to show either after they've submitted or after they filled in their answers. Checking this show post amble last will mean once they've submitted, they'll see kind of a thank you for submitting screen. If you leave this unchecked, they will see the post amble before submitting. So if you're having a survey and you want to remind people to double check their responses, you can leave that unchecked and you can in your post amble say something to the, you know, to the effect of please make sure to review your responses and make sure everything is correct. And they still have the option to go back and review their responses and make sure that everything is correct. If you check this box, they would not see that text until after submitting. So let's talk about if this wasn't an election. So before I save, I'm actually gonna cancel out of this and start one more survey. And this time I'm not going to check the election box. So the title and description remain the same. I'm leaving configure as election alone. I'm going to choose my category webinar example again. Now we have a few options that are actually mutable to us. So we can change these even though it's uh, because it's not an election. So for our availability, this is an option where we can choose a few different things. We can choose all site users. That means members and non-members. That means anyone who visits this website will be able to take this survey. We have members only, which means, you know, once again, we're limited to members. And that does give us our primary and solo members only option. We have selected committee which means we can li limit this to only a committee. So if we're having a survey or an election and only certain committee members are available to answer this survey or answer this election, um, sorry, this would not apply to an election. Only, uh, only committee members are able to um, fill out this survey. We can limit it to specific committees. And this is just the list of all of our available committees. And the last thing we can do is also we can limit it to selected member types. So we can go in and say only our gold members or only our corporate members if we wanted to ask for a survey response from particular uh, member types, we could do that. So if we have business members, we want to have a survey about what it's like to be a business member or something like that, we could pose this survey only to certain member types. For now, I will go ahead and leave that as all site users and I will let non-members fill out the survey. The survey button text remains the same. I'll say take survey. This is where we'll see our close method. So with our election, it was forced to end date, which we can still choose that without being an election, but we have two other options now. We have the manual option, meaning this survey will stay active until I return to my survey manager page and turn this survey off. So I have to come here manually and turn it off if I want to have it open essentially forever. The other option that we get is max responses. So once we choose the max response option, we can say we're looking for, you know, 15 people to sign up for something and we'll just do it as a survey. You know, are you interested in volunteering? Are you interested in being a part of the board? You know, whatever you're, for whatever reason, if you're looking for a certain number of responses, you can choose to have this turn off once you hit that number. So once 15 people have hit the submit button on the survey, it will no longer accept any survey responses after that. Then we also get our now allow anonymous responses option. So right now it's set to not allowed. This configuration would actually not allow non-members to take the survey. So once again, non-members to our website are viewed as anonymous. And because of that, if we do not allow anonymous responses, it wouldn't function for non-members because the only way we can tell who someone is if they're on our site is if they're logged in and non-members can't log in. So if we're going to allow non-members to take a survey, we have to set the allow anonymous option to optional, meaning whenever someone takes this survey, it will ask them, do you want to be kept anonymous or do you want to have your information recorded? The other option here is required, meaning we will not be recording who gives these answers. We're just recording the answers themselves. We don't care who took that survey. 
One more option that gets taken away from us when we're creating an election but is available for surveys is allow members to vote multiple times. So this is multiple survey responses. So if you're having, you know, uh, some sort of survey where it doesn't actually matter if you're just looking for, you know, art submissions or opinions on something or, you know, some sort of essay response where people can fill it in multiple times if they want, if they want to make some sort of submission process, you could allow people to fill in that survey multiple times. If it's the type of survey where you're collecting, you know, multiple bits of information from individual people. Again, contact person remains the same from an election. We can go in here and pick a member still, and we can choose to notify them on completion. A note about anonymous responses. If anonymous responses are optional or not allowed, if someone fills out this uh, survey in a non-anonymous method, so a member fills out the survey and they choose not to be anonymous or it is set to not allowed, then the person we set as a contact would actually be notified of who completed the survey when it is done. And then again, we have our post amble and that remains the same. So that is our survey configuration. Really, we've just talked about what types of surveys we're creating so far. We haven't actually talked about what information we're collecting. So that's gonna be the next part that we're gonna go over. Once you've created this and you've saved your options, the next step is to go in and record what information you want to collect as a part of the survey. So now let's go talk about survey responses. So I'm gonna close this window. And I'm going to go pull up a pre-made, just like a cooking show. We've already done the work ahead of time. And we've got our webinar enjoyment survey that I made ahead of time. And so if we wanted to create this survey, this is a simple survey I filled out. Um, I apparently had a typo in my survey button. So this is a survey I made ahead of time. And once you create a survey, it will show up on the list. When the survey is initially created, the status will be added. So we'll notice on this page, when I click on the pencil to look at my survey creation section again, there is one extra field, which is status. And the default is going to be pending. You'll notice pending isn't an option here because I've already activated. And once I activate, the pending option will go away. But because when you create a brand new survey, there aren't any questions tied to it yet, there's no way for it to be an active survey because there's no question. So it will always start in the pending, uh, the pending status. And once we've added our questions, we'll have to return to this page and then change this status to active in order for our users to begin taking this survey. So for now, let's talk about what it looks like to add questions. So there's that pencil to go back and change our configuration options. The next icon over on this list of icons, and you know Club Express loves their icon list. The next option over it has this little question mark, and this is where we can go in and edit what information we're actually collecting for our survey. When I click on this, it's going to take us to our questions page. And then we have a few buttons and a few ways to configure this page. I've already preloaded this, this uh, survey with a few questions, but let's walk through adding a few more. The first button we're going to get is page. So only on surveys, this is actually something that's not available on things like ad hoc forms or events. On surveys, you can have multiple pages of questions. So you can have a really, really long multi-page survey where you can ask hundreds of questions if you want. Um, if you are doing that, you know, that's that's up to you. We usually recommend keeping it to three or four pages and maybe about uh, you know one or two dozen questions. After that, people tend to you know lose interest and sometimes they'll click off. And if you click out of a survey, all of your responses are lost. So usually keeping your surveys to you know maybe a 15, 20 minute survey uh, question is is advisable unless your members are expecting to take a very long survey. When it comes to pages, whenever you initially start a survey, you're going to have two pages by default. You will have a scratch pad page and a page one. The scratch pad is a place for you to put questions that you are working on and are not complete just yet. So if you are editing a live survey and you want to add questions to it while it's still in progress, you can put those questions in scratch pad and those questions will not show up to members while it's being worked on. And then later on, we could move that question from the scratch pad into one of our existing pages. When you hit add page, 
it's going to give you a place to add a name and a heading for that page. So by default, it's just going to pre-fill a page number. You could be more specific with this and you could say, you know, uh, personal information page or survey, you know, it, uh, essay response page or, you know, whatever kind of pages you're having for your survey, depending on the type of survey you're asking. If you're doing this as an election, you could have, you know, board members elections, treasurer elections, you know, committee elections, you could have different pages for different groups of elections that you're holding. The next option you have once you've added your actual pages and once you add them, they will show up here. If I add a third page, it will just show up as an extra page down below. The next control we have is we can actually, if we decide um, it's better for us to have this page of questions, we don't have to go in and swap the pages for each question. We can just change the sequence that the pages show up. So if we say it's actually more advantage for page two to be shown first, we can go to our page sequence and this will just let us simply move pages around. And I can say page two needs to go up and I can use these little arrows and it will move that page up in the order. And if I save, now page two is higher in the order. If I say my original order was better, I can come back here, change it back to numerical order and save, and it will automatically move the pages uh, up and down without you having to manually reorder all of those questions. The next three buttons we get are actually adding individual questions. So the simplest option is just to add questions one at a time. So if we click add question, it's going to give us this survey question pop up and it's going to ask us a few things about the question that we are adding. The first it's going to ask is what page does this show up on? And here's all of our options. So again, there's that scratch pad page where we can put a question if we're not ready for this question to be actually showing up on our survey just yet. If you have not made your survey public yet, there's no need to use the scratch pad because the public aren't uh, answering questions to this just yet. The next option is page one, page two, or page three. So I'm going to go ahead and add a question to page three because it doesn't have any questions just yet. And then we get our what actually information we're collecting for this question. So we get a question name. A lot of people mistake question name for the question text. So they think this is where I'm going to put what question I am asking. This is actually for our reports and for our exports. So what we put here should be a summary of the type of question. So I would put, you know, uh, if I'm creating a question, I can say, what is your availability? And I would just put availability because that's a good way for me to remember that's the question I'm asking. The question text is actually where I will put the full sentence of what is your availability for webinars or whatever I wanted to ask. The next most important thing to ask, uh, and this is why we keep it in order, is what type of question are you asking? So we have at Club Express, we have a lot of different types of answers we can request. So we have things like heading instruction. That is, if we just want to display some text, it doesn't actually ask for an answer. The most common type of question that gets used is short text. So this is just going to ask your members to fill in a short bit of text so they can type in their own answer. Um, when we choose short text, you'll notice as I go through different answer types, it's going to flash the screen and change the lower section because different types of questions will have different types of configurations. So if I'm asking a short text question, my configuration down below changes to what is the maximum answer length? And this is going to be in characters. So the default is 100 characters. That's a pretty typical you know, piece of short text. I will go through the different types of questions, a few of these in just a second. But before I go through each and every one of these, let's leave it at short text and let's talk about the rest of this configuration very briefly. And then we'll go back to a few different types of questions. So the next thing you'll see is question text and you'll see a little formatted box. And this box will allow you to do things like underline and bold and, you know, change the color of text. This is a free form text editor. And this is where you can go in and actually ask your question. So this is an availability question. And I'll say, what is your availability? I'll add a little question mark there. Doesn't need to be capitalized. And we can come in here and we can do whatever we want to this. We can make this bold, italicized. Um, we can underline it. We can strike through some text. We can get creative with the actual um, appearance of this question text. 
And once we've added that question text, we can then do things like, you know, center line, we can add images. You can get really creative with this, but for the most part, you just want to put in whatever your question is. And once you've got it looking the way you want it to look, we can move on to a few other things. There is a section called notes. And so if we wanted to ask a specific note about, you know, this type of question, what is your availability? We can say weekdays only. And this will show up in smaller kind of faded font as kind of what we would call like instruction text, like letting members know like this is a less important, it's not the actual question, it's just a little note underneath the question when they are being asked. And I'll show you what that looks like um, once, we, once we configure this question. We can also choose things like default answers. So a lot of the answer types are going to have uh, an option for you to default an answer for someone. So we can say, you know, anytime. And then whenever someone is filling out this answer, it will pre-fill anytime as their response. And then they have the choice to come in and type over that and change their answer. Most times you wanna leave default answer blank because people are, you know, more than capable to fill in their own answers. As I mentioned earlier, maximum answer, answer length, because this is a short text qu uh, question, it is going to allow us to control how many characters they can answer. So if we're looking for, you know, just a weekday, some sort of answer like that, we could put in, you know, oh, we could put in 10 because there aren't any weekdays that have more than 10 characters in it. Um, if we're looking for a slightly more detailed response, we can leave it at 100 and let them type in, you know, a more detailed response. And then we get these three configuration options, and these are going to be um, on our question, no matter what answer type we are asking. So response required, that means they must answer this question in order to complete the survey. Uh, if we choose no, that means they can leave this answer blank. They don't have to fill it in in order to complete the survey. It's an optional question. If we say yes, there's no way for them to complete the survey without submitting a response allow comments. This will add a comment box underneath the question. So once they give their answer, it will give them an extra box, kind of like this notes box right here, where they can put in their own comments. So they can say, you know, I'm available anytime, but I'm on vacation, you know, June 5th through June 20th or something like that. Um, so that would just allow them to add additional comments to their answers. And those comments would show up on your survey reports. The last option here, allow in emailing. This is a kind of uh, I don't see this one get used a whole lot, but it is an interesting one. This will allow you to insert users' answers into blast emails that you send to them. So if someone fills in an answer to this question and we check this box, when we are sending emails to our members, we can choose an option in that email to say, fill in their answer to you know X question. One of the reasons this doesn't get, doesn't get used all that often is because very rarely will we have every single member in an organization have filled this out. And so if we blast this email out to all members and we say, your answer to this survey was, you know, insert answer, and someone hasn't answered it, it's not going to fill it in there and it will make the email make a little bit less sense. So the use case for that is pretty narrow, but when it is needed, is it is somewhat useful. Um, if you want to see how to add tags like this to an email, in our most recent um, emailing webinar that we did a couple months ago, we did go in depth on how to add tags. And when you're adding a tag, these questions will show up as tag options. So I'll go ahead and leave that as no, just because we're not going to be using that here. So once I've got this filled out and I've chosen my question type and my question text, and I've got the question that I want to ask, I would just hit save. And that question will now show up on page three. I'm gonna go through a couple more question types just to kind of show off some of the question types that we have. There are a lot of options here and I could probably spend the rest of our time just going over what each question type does and looks like, but I'm gonna kind of play the hits and I would encourage you to come in and play around with surveys um, in your own time. So as I mentioned, short text is one of the most popular. It's why we keep it at the top of the list. A really interesting one, there is also an option called formatted text 
And you'll notice instead of asking for how many characters or what we're looking for, we can predetermine certain types of answer formats. So we can say things like, I need a URL, and we will prevent them from entering anything other than something.com or .org or dot, you know, whatever. It, it would have to fit the format of a web address in order for it to be a valid response to this question. You can also do things like US phone numbers requiring a 10 digit US phone number. We can also require things like email addresses. So it's looking for that, you know, so-and-so at something dot something. Um, you can require a lot of interesting things here, like postal codes and UK postal codes. Um, there is an option for custom that a lot of people try to use, but I would honestly, if you're looking for a custom survey response, I would reach out to Club Express support to, to get guidance on that. It, sometimes the custom, it really depends on what, kind of custom field, if it's not an option here, creating a custom option using this is a little bit, uh, it's a little bit cumbersome. It seems like it would be self-explanatory, but it rarely works the way you would imagine. So if you're looking for a custom format and it doesn't fit one of these and it doesn't fit another option here, um, reach out to us and we'll see if we can't suss that out for you. So another option we get is long text. And this is when I mentioned kind of an essay response earlier, this is gonna give you a much larger character limit. So you can go up to 4,000 characters on a response um, and that will let them fill in, you know, uh, closer to like an essay response or something of that type. Otherwise it is the same as, as a short text response. We have a whole slew of date options. So things like just a year, just a month, just a day, you can choose date full, which will ask them to enter a, you know, like things like a birthday or your anniversary. If you're looking for a full date um, for them to enter, you can also ask for things like day of the week and it will just give them a, you know, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday option. Time of day that will give them a time uh, option. If you choose time of day, it will actually allow them to click on a little clock icon and they can choose um, a time from the clock icon, similar to the clock icon you'll see when you're configuring events and things like that. We have a few number options. We have things like number, which will allow uh, decimal points. And so you can enter very specific numbers. And then you also have things like integer if you're just looking for a whole number. So if you're just looking for a whole number, you would choose integer. If, you're, if you allow for decimal points, you would just choose number. And then these next three are probably my favorite. These next three are the ones that I use the most um, when I'm creating surveys, which I do you know, somewhat regularly. Um, select list would be a dropdown list. So this answer type, this dropdown that we're looking at, this is a form of select list. So if you want to give people an option to click a little dropdown and get a list of potential responses, select list would be the one you would want to choose. And you'll notice my configuration down below turns a little bit unique compared to other options I've had. If you're doing a select list, you can create your own list. So if we're asking, you know, what is your favorite color, you can go to this item list and say blue, red, green, yellow. And you'll want to put a, uh, a return after each of your answers. Because if we do something like, you know, purple, this would present them with an option of green purple. So whatever we break with a, with a return here will show up as one answer, one option. Anything not broken with a return would show up as, this would show up as green purple, not green or purple. So we would want to do green purple there. Once we filled in our list, we have a few interesting options. Anytime you're presented with a list option, there is an option to do allow other. And this would add an other option and when they choose the other option, it's going to let them type in just like a short answer does. So just like short text, it will give them a short place to enter their own response. So if you do check allow other yes, it would say blue, red, green, purple, yellow, and then it would say other, and they could type in their own favorite color if it's not something from the list. So that's a great option for when you're um, offering list options. Um, and then again, we have our allow comments and allow an emailing. So this will still show up. Like with select list, we also have a checkbox list. So if they are able to choose multiple options, you could do something like a checkbox list. And one of my great examples, I use this all the time when I'm creating events would be like dietary restrictions. 
So if we are asking, you know, for if you're attending an event or you're joining our club and you're coming to eat with us, do you have any dietary restrictions? It's possible for someone to be both, you know, vegetarian and allergic to peanuts. So we could choose here, peanut allergy and vegan and, you know, vegetarian and whatever other potential dietary restrictions, we could create a long list here um, of all of the different dietary restrictions some might be, someone might be able to have. We can also choose an option of none. And this is a great way to um, kind of make sure you're covering your bases with an event where you're having people show up uh, in person to eat and you can make sure that you're not going to accidentally contaminate someone's food. And we can choose here when we're doing a checkbox list, we get the options for minimum and maximum selections. You don't have to fill these in. If you leave minimum blank, that means they're able to select nothing. Or because we're giving them a none option, which is something I like to do when I'm creating these events with dietary restrictions, I will choose one as my minimum selection, meaning they have to, at the very least, choose none but then they can choose at least one or more of the others. And then because it's potential that someone could maybe have all of these restrictions, we will leave the maximum selection as blank and they can choose as many or as few as they need. I will also still allow the other because someone might be allergic to something that we're not aware of. They might have a specific you know, oil allergy or something like that. So I will still allow my other option. And then we can also turn comments on as well, even for these list options. So they can make multiple responses and then say, you know, to give light, I'm able to have, you know, walnuts, just not peanuts or something like that. And then one more on the item list option is radio button. Radio button is very similar to our select list option, except for instead of a drop down list, it's going to present them with all of the options, but only allow them to select one. So if you're doing dietary restrictions like I've just shown, you wouldn't want to do a radio button option because that would force them into only cho choosing one. And you'll see that minimum maximum selection option is now gone because a radio button will always force just one response. Um, so radio buttons, always an answer of one and a maximum of one. We do have other options like true or false. You also have options like multiple text boxes. If you have one question that someone can answer multiple times with short answers, a multiple text box will say you can have, you know, five short answers of, you know, a hundred characters. If you're answering, you know, manually typed in answers, but it's a question that they can answer multiple times. So if you're having, you know, say an election, you can say, would you like to write in any candidates? And they're allowed to write in, you know, up to six candidates. You wouldn't have to say, you know, write in candidate one, write in candidate two, write in candidate three, and so on. You could just say, do you have writing candidates and give them, you know, five, 10, 15 boxes to write in whoever they wanted. So that's the type of thing you could use a multiple text box option for. And then there's also a scale question. So you can say, you know, on a scale of one to 10 and for your column headings, you would do one, two, three, you know, four and so on to ask them a scale question. So if you had something that you wanted to ask, like, you know, or you could even choose like a lot of you have probably taken those, those surveys or quizzes online or something like that. It's like, you know, how pleased were you with, you know, our service, you know, very pleased, somewhat pleased, neutral you know, dislike, very dislike. Um, you could choose those as column headings and whatever column headings you enter, just like with a list, those would show up at the top. And I've actually created a scale question on this survey to show you kind of what that looks like, because that's something that um, it's easier to understand if you see it actually in action. Um, with a scale question, there is one more unique type of scale question that is kind of a little bit more popular than just adding one scale question at a time. And that is, you'll notice we've had this button that we've been looking at this whole time, this add question button, but there is a unique question button over here that says add scale question. And so when you look at my page two down here, let me zoom in on that if I can just a little bit. Uh, well, that's not gonna zoom for me. Um, if you look at page two here, you'll see it says webinar content, heading instruction, scale, 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 scale. So these are all roughly the same question over and over. I didn't add multiple questions in order to do this. I added this whole page too, just by using the one add scale question option. 
So when you add a scale question, it's going to give you a slightly different add question uh, page. So we'll add this to page three. Actually, I'm going to put this on my on my scratch pad because I've already done this. Um, so the question name would be, you know, scale one to five. Your question would be, you know, how did you enjoy the below? And so your question prompts could be, you know, how did you enjoy, you know, the presentation today? How did you enjoy last month's presentations? You know, what are your expectations for the next presentations? You can add multiple prompts and every prompt you add will be an additional question. And then all of those individual questions will be answered under the same heading here. So that was where we would put our, you know, very pleased, somewhat pleased, neutral, you know, negative, so on and so forth. Or if it's a scale of one through five, we could just put, you know, one, two, three, four, five. And those would be the heading options for on a scale of one to five. And that is how you create a scale question. And once you add that, it will automatically create multiple questions for each prompt. So let's take a look at what that looks like, because it's a lot easier to understand what I'm saying here is if you are actually looking at what it looks like. So this is my this is my survey questions that I've created for today. I'm asking questions like, what are your name? What's your phone number? What's your email? And then I've asked questions like, who's your favorite presenter? What's your availability for webinars? What's your favorite type of education material? And then I have a scale question about how you're enjoying the webinar. So let's go take a look at what these questions look like to our members. So when a member is actually going to take a survey, if we go back to our main page, we go and we click on the surveys module. So I've just put the surveys module on our menu. And when a member visits the surveys module, they will see a page that says that shows off all of the active surveys for them. Now I've turned off the rest of them, but if they have uh, multiple surveys available, all of the surveys that are available for them to take will show up on this page in more blocks like this. This is one of the things that I mentioned up at the very beginning of the webinar. This is a an updated look to this page. It used to be just a horizontal list of surveys with buttons on the right hand side, but now we see there's our title of our web of our survey. It says webinar enjoyment survey. There's our description that I mentioned earlier. So a survey for webinar viewers to record their opinions. And then there's my survey button, take survey. When I click on that button, it's gonna take me to this page. And this is that preamble I was talking about. I'm gonna go back and show you how to create, create a preamble. But for my preamble, I just added our logo and you know, thank you for taking the survey. Um, I will say, sure, I'll be anonymous. And this is what the questions are going to look like. So there's a, a simple short text question three times, you know, what's your name? And then on that notes option, I added optional. And that's where those notes will show up when you are creating a question with a note. It's going to show up as optional below that. Who's your favorite presenter? Obviously, it's me. When you are, when are you most available to join a webinar? This is a checkbox question where I can choose multiple options. So I can say I'm available, you know, every weekday, not available on weekends, but I'm also available on, you know, the fifth, if I wanted to manually type in an other option. So whenever I choose other, that's the little short box that's gonna give me to fill in an other option. And then here's what a radio button option looks like. What is your favorite form of Club Express education material? And I can only choose one because it's asking for a favorite. So I can't choose multiple here. If I check a different one, you'll see that I, it deselects whatever I selected before. So I'll say my favorite is the training videos. And once I have answered these questions, you'll see some of these questions have this little red dot next to them. If it's a question with a little red dot, that means it's a question we created and we said, this is a required question. These questions above that are optional, they don't have that red dot because I did not choose that required option. On the next page, when I click next, this is page two. This is that scale question I was talking about. So on a scale of one to five, please rate your webinar con our webinar content. And this is the page headers I was talking about. So there's our scale of one through five. And then here is our uh, prompts that we asked. So relevant topics, presenter pacing, recording quality, Q&A responsiveness. And this is where we can say, you know, fours across the board, 
or, you know, I didn't like the pacing, but the content and the topic were good. We can change the options here. And these are going to function like horizontal radio buttons, where if I change my selection, it will move the checkbox across in a uh, horizontal line, but I can have an answer for each row. And so we can submit our answers here and it will allow for multiple questions being asked in a very condensed way. So this is that scale question that I created earlier. And then this is that what is your availability question. This is kind of a redundant question, but there's my notes text that I added a few minutes ago, weekends only. There's my short text that I was asking for. And then if you do allow for question comments, this is where those can be entered. And so whenever you turn on the comments are allowed option, this box will be added to the bottom of that question and they can enter you know, 1000 characters of comments. And those comments will be tied to whatever question they are. If you're looking for comments on the survey as a whole, I would recommend adding that as a long text question um, instead of a, a comments on one particular question. I would make comments for the survey as a whole as their own sort of long text question. Um, I'll go ahead and cancel out. I'm not gonna submit my responses to this, or actually I will show you what that response page looks like. So we'll say, this is just a test response, so it doesn't matter. Once we have filled out our responses, we're going to get this summary page. So this will let us review our responses before submitting. So we'll see, there's my page one, there's all of my questions, and here's my answers. So I did not answer these questions. These are my responses to the different questions that were asked. And then I can, from here, if I'm happy with this, I can submit it. I can also choose to cancel it, or I can say, oh, you know, I didn't mean to choose, you know, I didn't mean to put test as the response to availability. And I can still go back. As long as I haven't hit submit, I can always go back to different pages and go through by clicking on the next and back buttons and go through and review my answers. So you can always change those. Once you hit submit, that is the only time that it is locked in. So now let's take just a brief minute to talk about pre and post amble, and then we'll mention some polls, uh, and then we'll go into a Q&A. So when we're talking about our pre and post amble, those are the next two icons on this page. So the first icon here next to our question icon is our preamble. And this is that option that we just saw before. And those of you who have watched our webinars on the formatted uh, custom page creators, this is our formatted text editor. So this is the same thing we saw earlier for our question text. We can do links, we can do images, we can do text, we can make it bold and underlined. This is just what's going to show up when they first click on the survey. So this is our preamble, letting them know, hey, when you're taking the survey, the responses will be anonymous. You can let them know, you know, please fill out the survey. The survey should take 10 minutes. Whatever information you wanna put ahead of them filling out the survey, you would put on your preamble. The next icon over looks just the same except for the little blue text on the bottom of the page. And this is our post amble. This is where we can put a thank you for taking our survey. And this is what they'll see at the end of the survey. This is what I was talking about earlier where when we choose to edit, the actual configuration of our survey, show preamble last. If we have this checked, we will see our preamble after we submit. If we have this unchecked, we would see this preamble before we go to our review page. So this would be show, this would show up before the page where we submit, but after we've filled in our answers. So this would be a great place to put, you know, hey, on the next page, you will see a preview of your answers. Please make sure they're correct before clicking on submit. So that's the pre and post amble. That's how to add questions and how to create a survey. Um, let's talk about polls very briefly. When we click on add poll, it's going to be a much simpler creation. It's gonna ask us for a name. And essentially this is just creating one radio button question. So this is going to say, you know, poll name, uh, option. So let's actually go, let's do all categories, search. And we'll look at an existing poll, favorite bootcamp session. This is one that we used after our bootcamp session. So this is, what was your favorite bootcamp session? The question itself is, what is your favorite bootcamp session? 
And then we have a list option of all of these available bootcamp sessions. So those of you who participated in our bootcamps a while ago, these are all of the dis uh, different sessions we had. And we were just asking for a simple um, way for people to choose their favorite. And then the button text is vote and the status is set to active. Very simple. It's just like one radio button question. And then once you save it, it'll automatically become active and it will not show up. Notice I'm looking at active options. These are both active. When I go to my surveys page, those polls don't show up. The way polls work is any homepage or custom page, you can add a widget when you're editing the page to show that poll. So to show what that looks like, Let's go to our features page. And this is a custom page that we created. And I just dropped this poll onto this page. So this is our favorite bootcamp session page. We can pick our radio button response. And we'll say the membership configuration session. There's our button to vote. And when a member votes, it will remember that that member has voted. It will show them how many responses. Now I reset the responses for this. So it's currently 100% of the people have voted for this because it's just me, but it will present them with all of the answers. And it'll also tell them your answer was this. And then once they've submitted, the website will remember that they've submitted and it won't allow them to answer again. So it's a very simple tool. And to add that to a custom page, if we go into our custom page editing, I'm not gonna go into the details of actual custom page editing, um, you can watch our page editor webinars to get details on how to get here. But really all you're doing to add a poll is once you've created it in that survey manager, there is an option called, I've lost it, where'd it go? Poll, there it is, sorry. My eyes were glowing right over it. So there's a widget called poll. You just drag and drop it and you choose from the available polls. So my other one is question of the month. I choose insert poll and that's all it is. So it just drops a, a poll onto a page. It's very simple, not a whole lot to it. Um, not very much to adding polls to the page. So the last thing we're gonna talk about is once a survey has been completed. So once people have answered a survey, let's talk about looking at the responses to that survey. So when we click on our responses option here, so again, that icon we're clicking, the eyeball is the take survey button. So we as administrators can click on this eyeball to take a survey. But the next icon over is this little graph. And this will let us go in and see how many surveys have been re uh, recorded. Right now, we just have one survey response and it was submitted by a non-member. And we can see no information about them because it was entered anonymously. If this was not entered anonymously, say by a member, we would see their name here. And we can also click this little view button to look at their responses. And so in here, we can see all of this member's responses to each of those questions. So they did not answer availability. There are their scale question responses. So how did they feel about the relevant topics? Five, how did they, you know, who's their favorite presenter? Dan Ehrman, you know, what is their availability? Only weekday afternoons. This is how we can take a quick look at one person's survey responses. This is also the page where we can delete all existing responses. So if we want to just toss all of our current responses out the window and start over, you can hit delete all responses. And it's gonna say, are you sure? And if you hit okay, then it will delete all of them. Keep in mind that if you choose to delete those, they're not gonna show up on your reports anymore. So you'd want to make sure to uh, record those responses if they were valid responses. Um, this is also a page where we can go to export all of our details and it will save a um, CSV file and an Excel file of all of the responses. That is one of the ways we can get a quick kind of look at all responses, not just one person's response. So export will give us an, an Excel spreadsheet with every single answer, who answered it if they're not anonymous, and it'll let us, let us tabulate those responses. Another way to look at um, different responses is with our reports and export options. So this export option is going to be similar to the export that we looked at on this bar graph page, but our reports here will give us a few different options to export. We've got our survey info, which is just gonna be the details of the survey itself, not the responses. We can get a survey response list, which will let us know if they're not anonymous, it'll just let us know who has responded to the survey. We can get an answer summary, which will let us know how many people gave what answer. So that's really great. If you're asking a lot of scale questions, you can say, okay, 10 people answered five out of five, 
seven people answered four out of five. And then you can just kind of average those out to get a get a, an idea of what type of answers you've gotten. And then these last two are probably the most important formatted responses and formatted responses, no names. These are going to be the full details. So if we're asking, it'll say, you know, uh, uh, you know, respondee one answered this, 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 and this. Respondee two answered this, this, and this, and this. You know, if you're asking these in a way that people were forced to be anonymous, then the difference between these will be uh, the same because if they're anonymous, it'll just say, you know, anonymous answer one here are the answers. If it's not anonymous, it would say, you know, Jim answered this, Joe answered this, Steve answered this. Um, if you choose the no name options, even if the answers were not anonymous, this will display the answers in an anonymous way. So if you're collecting survey responses and you want to share those responses with people, but not let them know who those responses were from, you can export those survey responses without names attached. And then you could share that with people without worrying about sharing uh, who gave what responses. And then finally, if we're done with a survey, you've got this delete option where you can come in here and you can delete the survey and it will just drop off the page. Keep in mind, if you fully delete a survey, it's going to also wipe out the response data. If you're done with a survey and you just don't want it to show up anymore or say we're done with a survey and we don't want responses, you wouldn't want to hit the delete option. You'd actually want to come over to the pencil again. And we would want to just change that status to closed. And that would actually turn our survey off without losing any of our data. So when I go over to examples, turn off my active only, this will keep and preserve all of my responses while setting the status to closed and people will not be able to um, take the survey anymore. And those services, those survey responses will be kind of locked in. Um, a couple of last things. You do have the option to copy a survey. So if you have you know, a satisfaction survey that you send out every year, you don't have to have just one survey that people fill out over and over and over. This clipboard icon, that's probably familiar to those of you who've used Club Express for a while, this will let you copy a survey and it will copy all of the details of the survey, but it will not copy the responses. So you could very easily say, you know, I want a webinar enjoyment survey for next year. And so I could say, instead of, um, it'll kind of copy all the details, all the questions, everything about it. And it'll say the title is going to be copy of, but instead I can say, you know, 2024 webinar enjoyment survey, and I can save that option. And now I've got an exact copy, but there are no responses to this survey. The last icon on the list, this is one of the uh, kind of, it's not very new, but it's somewhat new. We've added it in the past couple of years. Um, this little email icon, this envelope, this will let you customize the email that goes out when someone finishes this survey. So you can add a subject line. So you can say webinar enjoyment survey, if you wanted to change the subject. And then you can fill in some text here, and this will be the body of the email that gets sent out when someone completes a survey. So by default, whenever someone completes a survey, if they entered their email, they're going to get an email that says, thank you for submitting a survey. If you come in here and customize this page, this will become the body of that email. And then you can also overwrite, uh, overwrite the subject of that email here by entering your own subject. So you could say, you know, thank you for taking our survey and whatever content you want to put here, or thank you for voting, you know, your vote will be counted and we'll have results, you know, within two weeks or whatever you want to put in your confirmation email. This will just be specific to that one survey instead of all surveys um, and let them kind of control what that looks like. I know I've gone over time today, but I do want to show one more kind of interesting tidbit before we go into a short Q&A, which is how to customize the way surveys look. So if I reactivate this survey, set this to active, and I go take this survey, a lot of you may have noticed when I check these buttons, they are green. And my font for a lot of these answers uh, is just tied to my website font. A lot of you might say, well, I want my answers and my buttons to be a different color. I want it to match my logo. You know, for our Chicago Associated Financial Planners, we've got, you know, a blue background here with a purple lo lower bar and a lot of black. This green may not really fit your aesthetic. You can control the fonts and the colors of these functions. 
the place you control that is in your website look and feel. So this is something we added to our updated website look and feel. If we go back to our control panel and go to the website page, we can go to the setup section and click on website look and feel. And in our new website look and feel tool, you will have text styles. And this is where you can come in. And in our text styles, we've added an option called questions. This is a place where we can come in and we can change the color and the functionality of those options. So we've got the options to change our font. So we can choose any font that is built into our website. Um, and if you wanna see how to you know, add fonts, go take a look at our um, uh, website look and feel webinars, but you can, any fonts that have been added to your website look and feel will show up here. So we can change that to Roboto and that will change our question font. We can also change the size of those questions. So we can change the font and the font size. We can make them bold. We can make them italicized if we want. Um, and then we've also got the color control by default. These will be green. But if you have some club colors that you want to make sure you are selecting, you can use either the color wheel selector or you can plug in your own hex code or choose a color name. So we can manually put in a hex code or select a color. So if I want those to be say bright pink, this would change the buttons to bright pink for that uh, for all of those questions. We can come in here, we can change it to you know a gray selection and it'll turn those buttons gray. Um, whatever you want your buttons to appear as when people check off those either checkbox or radio button options, you can change the color that those appear as to match your website aesthetic. And you can also change the font to match your font style as well. So that's kind of the last tidbit I had. Um, I know I ran, pretty far over time. There's a lot to do with surveys. Um, Sam, what questions did we have? I'm sure we had a handful. We did. We had a lot of great questions. So a couple of things to kind of go over. Um, when you create a survey that doesn't automatically share the survey with anyone and it doesn't place the surveys module on your menu. So just keep in mind that the surveys module is an additional module. So if you wanted to make all of your surveys available to your members, you can certainly place it on your menu and allow them to just navigate to surveys and browse all of the surveys that you've created. You can also, of course, share those links in emails that you send out. You can place those links to a survey on a custom page or place a poll on a custom page. But you do have to do something with the survey to actually disseminate that to your members. So another question that came up, surveys for subgroups. So when Devin was going through creating a survey, you can create and configure a survey to be available just to members of a specific subgroup if you have multiple subgroups within your organization. But all admins and coordinators have access to that. So if you are familiar with subgroups, you know that you might have a subgroup administrator or coordinator that would only be able to see surveys for that subgroup. So we're going to pass that suggestion on to our developers so that it's more easy for you to manage those. And a couple of questions came up about reports. So there are a lot of specific things that you might be looking for in your survey responses. Maybe you're looking for a full detailed response list. Maybe you just wanna get a quick count of the number of answers to a specific question. So we have a handful of different reports available and exports for each survey. So browse those reports to see which ones are gonna give you the answers that you need. Um, and you know, again, they're gonna be different for everyone. And, also, and oh, sorry. I was gonna say also when, when we're talking about reporting, also keep in mind that um, all of your survey responses for those of you who are interested in or already have ad hoc reporting, survey responses are actually in ad hoc reporting as well. So if you're wanting, you know, bar graphs or pie charts about large surveys that you're having, that is possible through ad hoc reporting. Um, those are not necessarily built into the uh, built-in reports. So it's possible, it would just take, you know, a little bit of elbow grease. Um, in ad hoc reporting. Um, and I'll go ahead and address a question that I saw way, way, way back at the big, uh, beginning, which was, um, is this an included module? Yes, it is a, it is a built-in module with Club Express. There's no added fee to activate this module. Yes. 
And another question about testing out a survey. So when you configure a survey, the survey isn't available until you make it available. But when you create that survey, and Devin's showing you what that looks like, you can put a survey into test mode. And what that means is that you, your other administrators, board members can take that survey before it's actually active, test it out. We do this ourselves all the time. You wanna make sure that you didn't create any typos in your questions, make sure your question order looks good. You can take the survey in test mode and as many times as you need. And then once you decide you're going to make that survey available to everyone, you'll activate the survey. And at the same time, all of your test responses are deleted. So you can start fresh from scratch. And another question that came through that was a great question was um, if you could embed a survey into an event, for example, if you want to ask someone about food allergies or a meal preference. So you certainly can add a link into an event, uh, perhaps in your formatted description, but a better way to navigate that situation would be to use your event questions. And remember what Devin said at the top of our webinar, once you figure out how to use questions questions, especially in surveys, you're good to go with questions across the board, uses the exact same functionality. And what's great about event questions is that you're pulling from a bank of questions that you create. So you can create a question asking about a food allergy and reuse that same question in every event but your responses will be specific to the event. Whereas if you were creating a survey, you'd have to create a new survey every time you had one of these events because the responses are all going to be tied to that same survey. So let's say someone, you know, you're asking about a meal preference, you have meals A, B, and C, you'll add in that meal preference option for B and it gets reported with your registration. So again, those event questions would be tied to registration and it is, it's a lot easier and a bigger time saver than creating a survey for each event. Um, I did see a question. How can we share the survey in test mode? Um, test mode is only available to administrators and coordinators. And the only way to take a test survey is to go to the control panel and go to the communications tab and click on the survey and click this little eyeball icon right here. That's the only way to access a test mode survey. Um, so you would just inform your other, you can send them an email or a text or call them, let your other admins and coordinators know who need to test it out before sending it to the public. Um, if you wanted non-admins to take the survey ahead of time, you could you know, just name it test survey and let them take it a couple times. And then as I showed with this before, once you're done with the test version and they know for sure that it's a test version, you could then just copy it and say, you know, final real version. So there's nothing stopping you from having an active survey be used as a test, but if, if it's specifically in this test mode, right here, test mode, that is only available to admins and coordinators. It's not something that can be um, accessed by non-admins, non-coordinators. Um, Someone also asked for ad hoc reporting if they wanted to test it out. Um, ad hoc reporting has uh, two different price points. It's got a $200 per year price point, um, which is the base version. There's also a uh, an upgraded option for $300 per year, um, which will allow you to schedule reports. So with the base version, if you want to see a report, you'd have to go open ad hoc reporting and run that report. With the scheduled version, you can say, you know, hey, run this report and send it to me via email, you know every Monday or every Friday or every two months or however you wanted to set it up. Um, yeah. Um, there is also, if those of you who are, you know, getting to getting to know surveys and you think maybe ad hoc reporting might be useful, there is a test option. So if you go to your control panel and look for ad hoc reporting under the association tab, um, this website already has it enabled, but when you visit here, there is an option for right here when you're subscribing, there's a test option to try it out for 30 days. Um, so you can test ad hoc reporting, see what it's like uh, before committing to the full purchase. I think that that covers our questions. Um, I didn't see any new questions coming up. You want to take us away? Yeah, thank you for uh, allowing me to go over time today. Uh, but there's a lot to surveys and there's a lot to um, 
uh, ad hoc forms and a lot to event questions. So kind of the principles we learned in surveys are applicable a lot of other places in Club Express. So it's one of those things where the more you learn about it, the more you know about other parts. So we'll, uh, we'll talk to you guys later in our next webinar, but thank you so much. And we'll talk to you later. Um, keep an eye out for the recording of this in a few days.